It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Amigo Wade is a well-known figure in the area of uh, regulatory professional discipline in the United States. Amigo received his Bachelor of Arts from Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, and his Juris Doctor from Washington College of Law at the American University in D.C. Since 96, Amigo has been a senior attorney principal for the Virginia Division of Legislative Services, where he serves as legal counsel to the Legislative Committee on General Laws and Technology for the Virginia Senate. Prior to this, Amigo served as the Assistant Director for Investigation and Adjudication for the Virginia Department of Professional and Occupational Licensure. Since 92, he has been a senior instructor with the with the CLEAR, Council of Licensure Enforcement and, and Regulation, with the uh, National Certified Investigator Training, NCIT, which as you all know is the gold standard of professional investigational training. Amigo has instructed over 80 programs in jurisdictions throughout the United States and Canada and is a regular presenter of workshops, webinars, and training sessions in a variety of venues. So please join me in welcoming Amigo Wade. Good afternoon, how's everybody doing? Great, is that just all? Okay. Now I know some of you all are wondering um, about my name, um, Amigo Ricardo Wade. It is, does anybody speak Spanish? Because I, I don't. Um, it, <laughs> and um, David went over a lot of my very, you know, prestigious credentials, but one of the things I always like to say before I start is that um, my uh, most prestigious one is that I come from a long line of Southern Baptist preachers which means that I tend to get a little out of control. In fact, you all are going to get out of control. Um, my objective today is to kind of approach things from a different perspective. First, um, um, and I think it's really apropos um, that um, and I get points for using big lawyer-like words. Um, it is true. I, do we have any other lawyers in here? Yeah, I'm, I'm a lawyer, but I'm in recovery. And you all have to come to the meetings, too, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> um, Earlier today, you uh, talked about um, uh, the you know, writing rules and, 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 and regulations. I get involved in that from the legislative standpoint in terms of, re of, re of reviewing those rules. And uh, David, I think, was saying that um, you, you never finish because every time the legislature goes into session, they can monkey around with that practice, that practice act and you have to revise your regulations. Well, what I'm going to be talking about is how judicial review can sometimes serve to affect what you do. Um, sometimes you can have a court decision that will be a decision based on how you interpreted your rules and regulations that will um, make you have to rewrite your regulations, sometimes too, I'm clarified. But what I want to um, do um, is to sort of set the stage for you from an overall standpoint. Um, you know, I, I worked with, an, with a regulatory agency in Virginia for about 10 years before I, um, I started my job now. And, I, you know, I was in the trenches. I was an investigator, then I supervised investigators, you know, and then I did investigative hearings, and then I get, did, did hearings for, um, for um, final, um, final decisions. So, you know, I just ran the whole gamut, and then I was smart enough to get out of it before they realized that I didn't know what I was doing. So um, I went on to draft the legislation that now the people have to um, deal with. But I want you to look at it from the perspective, because when I got out of the regulatory arena, I began to see that, that, that uh, people look at what we do as regulators a little different. What I want you to um, look at is, um, you know, from this way, in a free society, the presumption is that you can do whatever you want to do as long as you don't adversely affect the rights of others. Law school professor explained to me this way, my right to swing my arms stops at your face. When you get into the regulatory community, what happens is the legislative body has made a decision that this particular activity, if people don't know what they're doing, I'm going to break it down to you in a Southern Baptist way, if people don't know what they're doing, then they can hurt somebody. So we need to make sure that before we allow people to enter into that activity, they have to uh, have a minimum um, um, credentialing. And I, I say that um, from the standpoint of they didn't delegate that authority to a regulatory board. And our job as regulatory entities is to establish emphasis, minimum standards of care and standards of practice. We love sometimes to establish standards of care and standards of practice that would create that, that, that perfect practitioner. But remember, the presumption is that the person has the right to enter into this practice. So, you know, and I kind of say that um, when I uh, passed the bar exam after I um, 
for the second time and I got my license. Um, um, <laughs> it wasn't the state saying, attention everybody, this is the next F. Lee Bailey. This was, it was the state saying, you know, Omega Wade has passed the minimum standards and you would not have wanted to have been my first client. So, so, um, so judicial review comes in when you have been delegated the authority to establish those standards of care and those standards of practice to the minimum and you make a decision and you look at the powers of a regulatory body, they have all the powers you know, in terms of they have the, um, the legislative power because they promulgate those regulations, they have the executive power because they investigate those regulations and then they have the judicial power to make a decision about whether the same regulations that they promulgated and they investigated have been violated. So judicial re review serves to come in as a control. And what they're doing in, in terms of how, uh, what they're looking at, they're balancing that right of the individual to enter into that occupation of right and your right, of course, as the regulatory board to protect the public. So what I'm going to do um, today is um, we have 10 decisions from um, jurisdictions in the United States and Canada. Um, I have four Canadian cases and I really want to um, thank Bernard LeBlanc and Mark Spector, um, who uh, they're, they're Canadian lawyers, and they picked those cases. These are cases that we did um, at the most recent CLEAR conference. Um, they cover a variety of regulatory bodies. Um, everyone from lawyers, you can't have a good discussion about bad practice unless you bring lawyers in there, but also nurses, medical examiners, and, um, and even pharmacists. Um, and, they, and we're looking at a, at a variety of regulatory actions, um, you know, in, in terms of, you know, revocations, disciplinary actions. Um, now, the, the way I'm going to proceed is I'm going to give you like a brief recitation of the facts. Then I'm going to do a quick session poll. Now, that means that this class, everyone has to wake up, okay? Not time to sleep. This class is what we call participatory. Now you have to give me $5 for using that word in a sentence today. <laughs> what that means is um, I'm going to give you the facts and tell you what the board did. Then I'm going to put up a poll question and it's usually going to be yes or no and it might be three. I'll let you know how many choices you have. And then you have to raise your hand when you want to vote for one. Now I don't have the, um, the, the clickers and stuff but I have on my glasses and I can calculate inside of my glasses how many um, people, so I'm gonna give you the rough de determination. You all trust me, don't you? No. I'm a lawyer from Virginia. Come on now. <laughs> all right. Um, let's let's look at the uh, first one. But, but here are the cases. If you have a chance, and I know we all have time for leisure reading. Um, I saw some of us doing it back in the back. Doing um, you better not be reading doing my preaching. No, just kidding. Um, but if you get a chance to read them, because what each of these cases uh, talk about, in particular when we talk about the um, U.S. cases, is they really give you a good idea of, of what the courts are looking at. What, what are the standards that they're looking at, the standard of review? And you find that, that one of the strongest things that operates in the regulatory community or the regulatory area is that there's a presumption that what the agency did was right. The court is not retrying it. You know, and you see in instances where the court is bending over not to second guess you know, what, what the regulatory body has to do is make sure that they're making the, a decision based on the facts and they connect those facts to, the, to their final decision. So that's what the cases are, the sites for them. The first case I want to talk about is the, um, probably one of the most famous recent cases, the uh, North Carolina Dental, um, of the Board of Dental Examiners versus the Federal Trade Commission. Now I say this is important because um, it's not very often that the United States Supreme Court uh, gets involved in professional and occupational regulation because it is truly a state issue. Um, at, it's, it's handled at the state level. But this was um, a situation where the Supreme Court did get involved and it was because there was a federal law that was involved, the, um, the Sherman Antitrust Act. And basically antitrust laws are there to protect consumers. And the idea is that you want the marketplace to be free and open and let the marketplace decide you know, who should be able to succeed and fail in business. Now, since 1943, there have been a line of, uh, of cases that have basically said that state action is immune from federal um, antitrust laws. And, I, and this includes the establishment of a regulatory body to, to basically establish licenses because that regulatory body says who can enter into that profession. And then it also says how they have to act in that profession. And all of those things can affect the, um, the, the, the economic side of it. Well, in this case, you had the, um, the um, dental board that was composed of six, of six dentists. 
one hygienist and um, one public member. I think what's sort of odd is that the, um, that the dental members by, it were uh, elected by members um, um, of the dentist community in North Carolina, which is unusual. I, any of you all from um, jurisdictions where the, where the licensed professionals elect the, um, the practitioner members of the uh, board? It typically, um, as in my jurisdiction, the governor appoints the um, licensed members. Um, sometimes it may be, you know, pursuant to a list that's provided by the trade association or something like that. Um, but um, I thought that would have made a difference. But um, according to the decision, they didn't really talk about the fact, that, you know, that it would have been better if the governor had um, had had appointed them. Um, they had been receiving complaints that non-dentists were being were engaging in teeth whitening, um, and um, teeth whitening, of course, um, is you make your teeth white. It's pretty clear. It involves the teeth, so it's dental. I would argue that um, that um, um, that they didn't go too far. I mean, that they that they really weren't going too far afield because in the um, in the North Carolina Practice Act, it says that the removal of stains from the teeth are the practice of dentistry. So I don't think it's a too much of a leap to say that whitening teeth is also the practice of dentistry. But at any rate, um, um, what they did was after they performed their investigation, um, they issued what are called cease and desist letters. And um, Dean touched on that. Uh, cease and desist letters are basically where you're um, informing someone who doesn't have a license that you think that the activity that they're doing requires a license. And y'all better stop now. We're going to have to do something to you. And that's what they did. They issued it to the um, people who were engaged in teeth whitening, the suppliers, as well as mall owners, because a lot of these situations were, you know, they were setting up stalls or kiosks in, in the malls. And they also contacted the um, cosmetology board and said, hey, we think that some of your uh, licensees are doing this too. So they sent out a directive. Now, the Federal Trade Commission um, thought that, hey, you've crossed the line, you've gone too far, you know. So that's why they basically um, filed a um, case against the board saying that um, uh, they had violated the um, um, uh, antitrust law. Now, first poll question. Should state professional licensing boards that include a controlling number of active market participants be subject to federal antitrust laws? You're going to have three choices here. First, how many of you say yes? Yes, we got some strong regulatory people over there. And by the way, there, we have hidden cameras, and um, you may be contacted by the government after this. Uh, yes, those that's, how many say no? And how many say should be decided on a case-by-case lay? Yeah, now, now you, that's a lawyer answer, so um, you know, I'm going to give you a law license at the end of this. And actually, see is 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 what's is what's right. Um, and I'll give you as brief as possible what, what the what the Supreme Court said. It said uh, basically that um, while certain forms of state action do have immunity, there are three key concepts. First, um, when you have a controlling number of active market participants, which basically means people who are still actively engaged in the profession, then you have to have um, then they have to be actively supervised by the by the um, by the state. Now, here's the problem with the um, case, and this is what the um, dissent said, is that they didn't basically define those three terms. What is the controlling number? Would you say it would be a majority? Well, people, people would say yes, but what if the three dentists on an 11-member on an board did all of their adjudications? What's an active market participant? Could you say that, hey, I want to suspend my practice for the time that I will, um, that I will serve on the board? a true public servant? Could you use professors? Could you use retired people? They didn't say that. And they didn't, also didn't say what does actively supervise mean. They gave some factors, but um, they didn't actually say it. What the, what the dissent said is that this is a bunch of hooey, which is a technical term. Basically, the moment that the state delegated that authority to the board, it's state action, nothing else has to be done. So you passed the first one. I'll move through the other ones more quickly. I wish I had time for, um, for um, questions, because um, um, th this is a pretty interesting case. Now, the um, next case is, the, is Kelly versus the Ontario, um, Ontario College of, of Physicians and um, Surgeons. Um, th this is a, um, an interesting case, um, also just by, in terms of nomenclature. Um, many of the regulatory entities in Canada are called colleges, as opposed to boards and whatever else we call them. Um, them group of people, I think, is what they call them in Oklahoma, I think. Uh, <laughs> Or North Kaki Lackey, which is North Carolina for those of you who are not. 
basically what happened in this case is um, um, the the um, the um, police had received information that um, that a that a doctor had some child pornography on his on his computer. If you get a chance to read the case, it's pretty interesting because it started in Dallas, where the where the where they looked at these um, internet um, um, addresses, and because of that, they tracked it to this guy. They sent it to the police in Ontario. They went in through a through a search warrant, and they took his hard drive. As it turned out, um, the search warrant was found to be invalid. So um, they basically gave him back the hard drive, but they kept a mirror copy of that hard drive. Now, of course, once the, um, um, once the um, um, board found out about it, they said, hey, he's one of our licensees. I want to get a copy of that. And he went to the court and said, hey, you know, this was improperly obtained evidence. It shouldn't be used for anything. And of course, the um, board said, yeah, but this is, a, this, is, this is an administrative case. It's not a criminal case. So we're talking about two different things. So session poll question number two, should illegally obtained evidence be admissible at a regulatory board hearing? Those of you who say yes, raise your hand. All right, those of you who say no, raise your hand. No's, the no's have it and the no's are incorrect. <laughs> That's just one judge's opinion, you know. <laughs> who do they think they are? They're just judges. Um, and, and this is what the um, um, court said, is that um, basically um, you, um, with, if context means everything. This was a criminal case. And, and, and um, uh, what you're looking at here is an administrative or civil case. And, he, and the court basically said that we leave it up to the board as to whether it, it should be admissible. And, um, and I think that that would be the same situation here in most of the jurisdictions in the United States. Criminal protections you know, don't specifically apply to administrative proceedings. And I, I think that the same thing would probably have happened here. Now, mind you, the um, board could have come to the same result and say we're, we're not going to use it if, if, if it was improperly obtained. What the, what the court was saying there is that we're not going to make that decision for the board. Now, let's look at the um, third case. This involves a nurse in the great state of Delaware. Um, here are the facts of the, um, of the um, case. Uh, uh, you had a nurse that was working as a, as a, uh, as a supervising shift nurse, um, station nurse at a psychiatric hospital. Uh, one of the patients came out of their room, walked around a bit of a while, um, and just fell out, which is a technical term, which means you passed out. We say fell out, you know, below the Mason-Dixon. Um, what she did when she found out about it was she went to that person who, who, who was on the floor, um, called out her name a couple of times, um, and she didn't hear a response. And she made a decision that since the person was breathing, that it wasn't a medical emergency, it was rather a psychiatric situation, so she went to get help. Now, mind you, when she went to get help, the situation went bad, and the person died from a pulmonary embolism. And the issue in the case was, you know, um, basically they said that, that um, she did not, was that she was negligent because she did not perform a physical examination of the patient, you know, and, and some of the facts in the case say that one of the reasons that she didn't was because she was much smaller than the person that had fallen. The person had a history of, of acting out and um, she was afraid. Of course, um, um, of course, you know, in this case, the practice acts that you have to, or what the board was saying was that the only way you're gonna really be able to assess that patient was to physically examine them. And that's basically um, what, what, um, what um, happened. Now here's your next poll question. Um, and let and, and me make this clear also that um, her argument um, at the case was that um, in order for her to be found negligent, the board would have to show that her negligence, her failure to assess the person, the patient, actually led to the harm, which was the um, death. And the board said, we don't have to show that. You know? And um, my question to you is, should every finding of negligence be required to include evidence that the negligent conduct caused harm? Those of you who say yes, Raise your hands. Okay, that's about seven. <laughs> Those of you who say no, raise your hand. And that would be the majority. And you are correct. And this is what the board said, um, and, and this is um, what's, what's, in, what's important. And this is how um, I think one of the things that we have to make clear um, when it comes to um, standards of care and standards of, um, of practice is that once the regulatory board establishes that standard of care and standard of practice, does not have to be necessarily tied to what goes on in the civil arena. 
or in common law or in the common law arena. And what the court said is um, basically um, that, um, that, that the record established that under the board's rules, the nurse had a standard of care, had a duty of care, and that she breached it. And that's all they had to prove. They didn't have to prove that the harm, um, that harm came be because of, of that um, breach. So they up, upheld the um, board's decision. And this is also Im important when it comes to establishing the record. You know, it is very important that, um, that, um, that boards um, include in, in the record everything that they use to reach a decision. Because when the case is appealed, what the court is looking at, they're not bringing the witnesses in and talking to them or, or, um, or, or, or examining them again. They're looking at the record, the transcript of proceedings. And they're looking at the, at the board's final order. And they're looking at, you know, what is the board basing its decision on? So in this case, the board had sufficient facts. All right, this is an, another Canadian case, and it also in, involves the Ontario College of Physicians and Surgeons. I just like saying this, this name. It sounds like something you would say when you're out on the, on the town um, on a Friday night. Yazdenfa! <laughs> hey, you want to go to the bar? Yazdenfa! <laughs> At any rate, somebody's had too much coffee. And, but um, having said that, and, 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 and I know it's um, funny, it's sort of a sad case. This is a situation where the person was qualified as a family physician, you know, just a, basically a down-home family doctor. But at some point, um, the physician decided, you know, I'm going to specialize in, um, in um, doing some cosmetic surgery. And she specifically specialized in doing liposuction and breast aug augmentation. And in this case, you had a patient that died after a liposuction procedure. And um, following that death, of course, it was, um, from what I understand, it was, it was, you know, it was in the news a lot. Uh, the investigators for the, um, for the board went out to um, interview the Miss um, Yazin Farr. Now, that board, much like many of our agencies, they have a regulation that requires you to, you know, cooperate with the investigation to answer questions. You know, there is no right against self-incrimination in administrative cases. That right applies when police officers are investigating a crime and they're asking you about it. Doesn't apply in the regulatory arena. In fact, several of the boards with the agencies I used to work for have, a, have as a separate violation a failure to cooperate with the investigation. So you don't have a right um, um, against self-incrimination. Um, now, what happened in this case was because um, the um, licensee had to talk to the, um, to the um, board, um, she relied on, on, an, uh, on an act in Canada called the Public Inquiries Act, which is somewhat similar. But it basically says that um, if you have a compelled statement, then that statement can't be used in a later proceeding. So what she was saying was that the investigation was separate from the board's hearing. Now, before I get to that, I want to get to poll question number number four. Everybody ready? Got your arms ready? Can a compelled statement obtained during the investigation be used against the regular in a subsequent board disciplinary hearing? Those of you who say yes, raise your hand. Oh, yeah, we got a lot of people there. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Now, for the three of you who have the courage to raise your hands for no, <laughs> those of you who say no, I was like, I'm not going to get a run out on a rail. <laughs> and the answer is yes. You know, and it's, again, it's the context. This is an administrative proceeding. This is an action between the board, the regulatory ent entity, and one of its licensees. Um, and, and that's exactly what the, um, what the um, court um, said. Um, they upheld the um, violation. Uh, a compelled statement um, that's used during the, the, during the course in, of the investigation can be used at the disciplinary proceeding because it's all a part of the same process. And that's what they said. And in fact, the um, court said that, um, that um, to um, look at it differently would just tear down the whole regulatory framework. I mean, if your investigative process was separate from the discipline, then the whole process would have to be redone. And that's what the court said in this case. It's all a part of the same proceeding. Now, uh, this is um, what I like to call a um, paper case, and, and, it, and it involves a um, situation where um, you know, one of the things that uh, happens when you issue licenses is that they're not for life. You know, they have expiration dates, and you have to renew that license. And many boards had a situation like the Iowa Dental Board had. Um, in this situation, the um, person, um, his, he was originally licensed in 1996, and in Iowa, dental licenses um, expire 
every August the 31st, which basically means that um, you, know, you have to get a new license. They give a 60-day um, grace period. So there's a 60-day period of time where you can pay some additional fees and still be licensed. After that 60-day period, the license has lapsed. Now, that can mean different things in different states. In my state, if a license lapsed, well, I'll put it this way. In my state, if your license, uh, let's say if it ended on August the um, 31st, and um, you have six months, and I'm talking about the Board for Contractors, to, um, to issue, to um, get your license back, you have your license on life support. You know, it's there, you know, it's on life support. If you pay additional fees, it can be, you know. After that six months period, it's lapsed, which means that the stake has been driven through the heart and there is nothing to renew. And that's what sort of happened in this case. Um, after the, um, the um, um, grace period, the um, board considers the license to have lapsed and basically um, um, is saying that, hey, you're doing unlicensed activity. You're practicing without a, a, um, a um, license. Now, here's the um, kicker in this case, and this goes to what's called mens rea, you know, you know the intent. Um, now, you all learned a big legal word today. You're going to be able to charge big time money for that, mens rea, which means intent. And um, what he said was, look, um, I knew that my license was, um, was about to expire. In fact, I remember it like it was yesterday. It was, and then the little screen appears. It was August the 30th. I had gotten a check, and he had a copy of the counter check that he had gotten from the bank. And I remembered it because I mailed it at, um, on my way to lunch. And I, of course, I ate lunch on that day. Now, the board never received it. And what actually happened was um, uh, he kept on trucking along, thinking in his mind, so he says that he had renewed his license. And it wasn't until several months later, the, um, the insurance company contacted the um, board and said, hey, we're about to renew the insurance for this guy. Is he licensed? And the board said, hey, no, he isn't. His license has expired and lapsed. And that's why they, um, they um, issued or filed the, um, the um, position, um, uh, filed the disciplinary action. Now, here is um, um, poll question number five. And this is a long one. You can tell a lawyer wrote this one. Uh, should a regulant with a lapsed license be charged with engaging in unlicensed practice if the regulant believed the license had been <laughs> validly renewed and can produce evidence supporting that belief? Hmm. Those of you who say yes, raise your hand. The kinder, gentler regulators. Even the one that raised his hand late, and, and that's about, you know, maybe about 30% uh, of you. Those of you who say no, yes, yes. You are the regulators. You're the one that when you do your job, you do it to action music. Dun, 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 dun. What the, board, um, uh, what the board said in this case actually um, um, is um, yes. It's sort of a, a tricky one, okay, and I'll, and I'll, um, and I'll tell you why. Um, what the court said is, is that in, a, in an unlicensed activity case or in the case of this situation, all the board had to prove were two elements, you know, and, and they were um, one, that, um, that Hagen engaged in the practice of dentistry and that he didn't have a license. They didn't have to prove that he didn't know he was unlicensed. And you find that with a lot of standards of care and standard of practice issues. You don't have to prove intent. Now, as we see with, um, with, with the next case, sometimes you do have to prove intent if you say things like someone who knowingly, or if you see those words, or who, um, who um, deliberately, if you see that in your regulation, then yeah, you have to prove intent. But typically what our regulations say is, um, you know, uh, failure, to, um, failure to cooperate with the board investigation. Doesn't say, you know, really, you know, failure to deliberately, you know. So, you know, a lot of what we do in our, in our area is what's called strict liability. Just prove that it happened. You don't have to prove that you knew what you were doing when you um, did it. And that's basically what the um, court said in that case. Um, this is the lawyer case, and I picked the lawyer case from um, Canada because um, I could not find a lawyer case in the United States. We're just so ethical down here. <laughs> that's, that's a lie right there. So, um, <laughs> In this case, um, uh, this is sort of an in interesting case. You had a, a, um, a um, lawyer who represented a client um, in a civil action. It was a class action suit where um, he was due to receive a pretty big settlement. He also represented the same client in a, um, in a child custody issue, 
because he was back in his, in his child custody payments. Now, the, um, the former spouse said, huh, I see he's about to come into some money. So she went to the court and got the court to say, look, we think you're going to get into, this, into some money. If you get a settlement, the first $50,000 of the settlement has to be given to the court to, to, um, to um, fill out this or to um, in pursuant to this, um, to this uh, back child support. So what the, um, what, the, um, what the lawyer did is basically he established a scheme so that um, he avoided paying that first $50,000 of the settlement in, into, the, um, um, in, into the court, and he was um, subsequently um, charged by the um, board with conduct unbecoming of a lawyer, which is an oxymoron. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a nice book title, The Unbecoming of a Lawyer. And, the, and, and that conduct, they said, was by breaching the court order and by counseling and assisting the um, client. Now, what he said, of, of, of course, is, is that, um, um, no, you can't because I didn't think I was doing that. I thought I was representing my um, client. Now, my question to you is we're using that big $10 word that you can use at the next cookout, and you, people think you're real smart. The poll question is, is mens rea or intent required to prove the offense of, pro of professional misconduct. And I even spelled it the Canadian way with the C. You see how? Anyway, those of you who say yes, uh, raise, raise your hand. I think you, you have one person, we have, two, we have one person to call, one person to raise, rub their eye. I, <laughs> those of you who say no, yes, um, there's a third option I should have told you. Sometimes. <laughs> I got you. Yeah, one person, he said, yeah, I was, I was waiting for I was going to say sometimes. And the answer is, of course, sometimes. Now, how many of you who said no would have said sometimes? Yeah, I'm so sure. <laughs> and, and that's sort of what the, uh, what the um, court says. Um, um, it basically says that, the, um, that um, professional misconduct is generally what's called a strict liability. Um, offense. What that means is that you just have to prove that it happened. Unless, and, and that's where the sometimes comes in, if your regulation uses words like um, intentionally or deliberately, um, or thing, then you would have to show, um, or you would have to have evidence of intent. And you see that in situations where you don't want someone to be um, held in violation because they made a good faith mistake. All right, we're moving along very well. The uh, next case um, um, is uh, another sort of paper case, and this involved a medical examiner. You got to have um, a good medical examiner case, a lawyer case, and a pharmacist case to have a really good discussion about what happens in the regulatory arena. Um, now, in this case, I want to try to get you to, to um, track the uh, fact patterns because this is all about time. Okay, you're in time and space. You're with Doctor Who. Okay, we're floating on the waves of time. Okay, in 1995, Miss Oni was licensed in Tennessee. So you have Tennessee. In 2000, she was licensed in New York. So she's moving around. All right. In January of 2003, she was charged with, in Georgia with burglary. All right. So now go forward a little bit. October of 2003, it's time to renew her license. They have a question on license application that says, since your last registr registration application, are there any criminal charges pending against you in any court? She answered no. So she didn't refer to the Georgia charges. Now, fast forward four years. It's August of 2007. The, um, board, the Tennessee board issues a letter of reprimand to her for some conduct that um, she did. So fine. November of 2007, her license is up for renewal again. This time she answers to the, um, to the um, question, since your last light, um, um, registration application, has any licensing authority reprimanded or otherwise disciplined you? She answered no. Now because of that, and the New York board found out, they revoked her license. When the Tennessee board found out about what the New York board did, they revoked the license. And um, basically um, what, what um, she appealed saying that, hey, they just rubber stamped what New York did. You know, they shouldn't have been able to revoke my license because New York revoked, they shouldn't have been able to revoke my license in Tennessee because New York revoked my license. And the, and the lower court said, yeah, I think you're right. 
So then the agency appealed, and I'll tell you what the decision is as soon as I get your poll question answers. Oh, this is so this is suspenseful. And I see something. What happened? I wonder what happened. <laughs> if a professional license is revoked in one state, should it automatically be revoked in all other states in which the individual is licensed? Those of you who say yes, raise your hand. Okay, I think I saw one or two people. All right. Those of you who say no, raise your hand. And it's, oh, I'm sorry. This is only two choices. <laughs> Golly, man. You, yeah, and, and the second, the only two choices, and those who say no, wait, raise your hand. Yes, that is, and, and that is the, the correct answer. And it's really, really straightforward. What the court said, um, and this is where, where it gets to making sure when you make a decision about um, um, someone's license um, that, you, that, you, that you do it based on the evidence. In particular, when you're talking about license revocation. License revocation to the regnant is the, is the death penalty. It's the supreme penalty. So, and what the court said is that, you know, you can't simply do it because New York did it. We needed to see something in the record to show why you did it in this case. It could have been as simple as having a statement, we think that the, that the conduct that's at the base of what New York did supports a finding of you know, improper conduct in the practice here and based on that. So basically what the court said is we're going to send it back to you to reconsider sanction. They may have come back with the same sanction, but they just have to have some information in the record to say why they did what they did. So simply rubber stamping it was, was, was not appropriate. All right, um, the next case, which is case number, number eight. Um, Sobeys, um, uh, this is Sobeys versus the um, College of Pharmacists in British Columbia. Sobeys is the company that uh, basically uh, runs the um, Safeway stores in, um, in um, Canada. Now, you all know what Safeway stores are. Best donuts, you know, you know, but Kroger's ran them out of Virginia, so we don't have any Safeway stores in Virginia. Basically, what they, um, um, Sobeys had, what a, had one of those customer incentive programs. You know what those are where you have to be a member and then you can get, um, you know, uh, discount rates if you spend a certain amount of money. How many of you all are a member of a um, customer incentive or loyalty program? I, I'm, I know because my keychain has 20 of them on there. <laughs> I'm a member of everyone that I can possibly be a member of. Um, and basically what the, um, what the um, and, and I'm not loyal to any of them, you know. <laughs> you know, whoever has the best sale. Um, but um, basically what, what the College of Pharmacists said is that, you know, we think when it comes to buying drugs, that people shouldn't be incentivized. We're afraid that people might say, hey, I'm not going to get my drugs until the first of the month because I want to use up my, I, I wanted to use it to, to start developing my loyalty points so I can, you know, get some discounts. And they say, we just don't think that's, that's a good idea. So we're going to establish a bylaw, which is a regulation that, that basically says that um, incentive programs are prohibited. You cannot have, you know, a pharmacy cannot have an incentive program for um, customers. Now, um, Sobeys basically said, no, you, you're ridiculous. That has nothing to do, you know, you, you have overstepped your, um, your um, bounds. This has nothing to do with public protection. In fact, you're hurting the public because you're making them have to pay more. And um, which brings us to the, um, to the, um, to the next um, session poll question. Should pharmacies be permitted to offer customer incentive programs? There are only two choices. I, I was going to try to trick you and have a third one, like only on Thursdays, you know. <laughs> Those of you who say yes, raise your hand. That's because all of you all have a keychain that has 20. <laughs> Those of you who say no, raise your hand. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, what's even worse is when you go to, because I have one for all the grocery stores in Richmond, and it's about five of them. I have all the major ones. When you go there and you give the wrong card to the wrong store, it's like they look at you like, you cheater. And I'm like, I'm sorry. I get around, you know? <laughs> and what the court said um, was yes. What they said, um, what the court did basically was they struck the rule down as unreasonable. And this gets into the rulemaking authority. This is one of the only cases I could find that had to do with rulemaking. Um, you have the ability, you know, to establish rules, you know, for standards of care and standards of practice, you know. But, you, but the court can sometimes, if it is... Um, um, if it is if it is appealed or if it's um, or if it's taken to the court, they can look to see if your if your rulemaking was reasonable. And in this case, the um, court said it was overly broad. How can you connect the incentive program or the prohibition on incentive programs to protection of the public? 
And that's why they, um, and in, in fact, they actually said that the, that, the, um, that the rule was actually harmful, agreeing with Sobe, saying that it actually you know, made um, customers pay higher prices. Um, so um, let's go to the, uh, to the uh, next one, which is um, an Ohio State pharmacy case. In this case, um, you had a um, pharmacist who was accused of following, of following a, um, a female coworker. Um, he was, um, doing the investigation, um, he lied about what actually happened. He said it was consensual. Then he changed his mind and said that it was, um, you know, it was a mistake. He was actually re reaching for pills or, or um, something. Um, so they actually found him with, um, with you know, following the, um, the um, employee, lying to the, in to the investigator and failing to cooperate. And what the board said was that we found that action to be um, uh, grossly immoral, which is sort of an unusual standard. You know, immoral is bad enough, I would think, you know, particularly if you're a Baptist, you know, but grossly immoral? Um, but, um, and basically what, what, what he said is that, um, I, what is grossly immoral? I mean, you have to tell me what grossly immoral is because I'm out there, I'm a practitioner, I might do some immoral stuff, but I don't know what's grossly immoral. And that's basically the, um, the, um, the poll question that I want to ask you is, should a statute or regulation making gross immorality a cause for disciplinary action include a specific definition of gross immor immorality? Those of you who say yes, there's only two choices. Those of you who say yes, oh, yes. Um, about half, you think? A little, yeah, a little over half. Those of you who say no, it should, be, it should be determined by the board. And that's basically what the court said. Many of us have regulations that make it a violation to be um, engaged in improper or dishonest conduct. What is improper conduct? And see, the um, principle here is, is that as a licensee, I need to be given some signal of what objectionable, you know, what the prohibited conduct is. I don't know what's improper. I don't know what's grossly immoral. And what the court said here was um, basically um, that um, you can't say that a, that a statute is, is, um, um, is unconstitutional because it doesn't define every relevant statutory provision. They even went further. They said you can pick up a dictionary and get a definition of what's grossly immoral of those, of those terms to um, gather. And what they said here, and, and this kind of goes back to what I was saying in, in terms of when you do your disciplinary actions and when you, you know, make sure you include in the record why. In particular, if you're dealing with something like gross negligence, grossly immoral, improper conduct, you, know, you need to include specific factual basis for that finding because the court's gonna wanna see it. Um, they said basically that when they looked at the, at the, at the board's finding, um, um, there was enough information in the record to support their assertion that it was um, conduct that was uh, grossly immoral. Now, we're at the last one, so we may have some um, um, time for some, um, for some questions, maybe one or two. And, or I might tell a joke. You, no, I just. No. <laughs> no. Um, this one was a, I chose this one because um, there are some professions that are regulated at the local level. And um, this is one of those professions, things like pawnbrokers. Uh, precious metal dealers, and the issue that comes up when you're dealing with pawn, pawn brokers and precious metal dealers is that sometimes they can get involved with purchasing or fencing or moving around stolen property. So there is a very strong um, 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 criminal protection issue there. In this case, um, Mr. Balletta was convicted of dealing narcotics in 2006, and he served three years. Um, when he got out here, he, he applied for a license as a precious metal dealer. Precious metal de dealers, um, basically, um, they purchase precious metals. It can be sometimes someone just says, I, um, I don't need this wedding, this wedding ring anymore. I'd rather have the cash. You know, uh, They could also say, I'm going to knock David in his head, take his wedding ring, and take it to a precious metal dealer. But basically, that's what they do. They, 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 they deal in precious metals. Um, the license was denied because of a statute um, that basically barred issuing a license to anyone who had been convicted of a felony. And basically, um, um, his position was that um, that's unconstitutional. It's, it's a violation of the Equal Protection Clause because why are you treating 
felons different from anyone else, you know? Um, and basically, that's the poll question that, that, that I want to ask you. And this is a three-parter, okay? Now, you've got to finish with a big finish, okay? I want everyone to participate, okay? Because I believe that I'm going to get something free if everyone participates. If I... <laughs> the, that's why I don't mind. <laughs> we'll yeah. talk later. That means a sandwich, so... Uh... <laughs> the question, should an individual with a past criminal record be prohibited from receiving a professional license? We have three choices here, okay? First is yes. Yes, you, yeah, you, yeah, I know everybody's looking for the third one. Second one is no. Here's the big finish. And the third one is yes, if the previous criminal activity has a connection to the regulated activity. Oh, I'm gonna pass out, man down. And that is what the court said, you know. <laughs> Basically, what it said is that the statute was unconstitutional because um, there was no rational connection to the life, to not issuing the license to the stated objective, which is, in this case, the stated ob objective was to prevent criminal activity. They wanted to make sure that people that were involved in dealing precious metals did not have a criminal background. Now, in this case, or, or um, what I, when I say that, I mean felons. In this case, um, they probably... Um, could have just, you know, had some information in the record to say, we think that this conduct as a drug dealer somehow relates to not being able to um, be a, a upstanding, upright, um, precious metal dealer. But in this case, they simply said, you're a convicted felon. We don't care about what you were convicted of. You are a convicted felon, and because of that, we're going to not issue the license. And the point that we make here, or that, that can be made here, is, Remember to um, you know, step back out of the trenches that you're in back there working and doing your regulatory stuff. This is the way that courts look at things. They don't look at things in terms of what your authorities are. They look at what I was saying. The persons, the presumption of the person being able to enter into a useful occupation of life and that right of being able to do that can only be limited if there's a protection of the public interest and that's what happened in this case. As I said, if the, um, he still could not be issued the license, but what the, what the board may have to do in that case is have some information in the record to support their decision. And if you have a situation where you have what's called the presumption of agency regularity, which means that the court wants to find in favor of the regulatory body, the, the regulatory body would probably win. So with that, we have um, time for just a few questions, if, um, if there are any. Join me in thanking Amigo here. We do have time for just a few questions, and um, uh, Greg is going to bring the microphone around. Please ask questions. Uh, if we don't get any, Amigo is threatened to sing. <laughs> so we, we need your questions. You don't want this. Thank you for speaking today. Um, the question I have is related to um, from boards that are – do not act, or the perception that, that we do not, they do not act when a complaint is filed, mm -hmm. that someone's performing a legal activity or not practicing as an unlicensed practitioner. Is there anything that we can do, uh, and I hate to say the word, um, bring them to court for mm -hmm. not acting? So for example, person, there's a claim that a person's not practicing with a license, and they come back and say, well, we need corroborating evidence of someone actually saying it, and but the person filing the complaint has made that, but they haven't been physically present mm -hmm. to see them practicing, but they are, all the other evidence right. is noticeably yeah. there. Yeah, I mean, I'm one of the people that, you know, in this arena who's a proponent of, you know, that regulatory boards do have a responsibility to go after unlicensed activity because it, it does two things. It, it hurts the person who plays by the rules. Um, um, it makes that license almost less valuable. Um, because someone can do it without having the license, and you don't protect the um, public. Um, in the agency that I used to work for, um, I'll just use one profession as, a, as an example, um, contracting had a very big problem with unlicensed activities. So a special unit was established um, of investigators who specifically investigated allegations of unlicensed conduct, um, unlicensed activity. Now, in my jurisdiction, um, and I think this is the case in most U.S. jurisdictions, Unlicensed activity is a criminal violation. You get into a whole nother set, you know, the standard of proof is higher, and typically agencies um, and boards don't have the ability to 
um, prosecutor on their own. They have to take it to the Commonwealth attorney. In that um, situation, um, the, um, the agency was able to work with the Commonwealth attorneys, um, and in some cases, we're able to get um, a situation where with the Commonwealth attorney in that jurisdiction's um, permission, they could present the case themselves. And that really made it, um, that really caused a, um, a, um, a um, change. So if they're not willing to do that, would, is, would it be advised for the person to go straight to the, to the legal authority in that, where that person lives and operates to file a complaint for possible criminal activity if the board doesn't want to do that? Yeah, I mean, it is a crime. Now, the problem that you're going to have, that, that you're going to deal with, and it's a practical problem. I mean, it, it's a problem that um, we had is that, um, you know, there's nothing that sexy about unlicensed activity. Um, I got a murder trial, I got a drug trial, I'm not going to go after someone who's not licensed as a um, contractor. So what, um, what um, we did was sort of met the middle ground. We did the investigation and gave them a meal already prepared and all they had to do was make a decision, will I prosecute or will I not prosecute? And sometimes, um, you know, in a majority of cases, they either would prosecute or let the um, investigator present the charges. Thanks for asking the question. I'll give you half of whatever David gave me for asking the question. <laughs>